Hello, this is John Anthony West, welcoming you to episode two of Magical Egypt, a Symbolist Tour. In this episode, we'll be exploring acknowledged Old Kingdom Egypt, dating from about 2700 to 2200 BC, and we'll be providing evidence for unacknowledged and highly controversial still older Kingdom Egypt, stretching back perhaps tens of thousands of years. This notion is dismissed, often ridiculed, by academic scholars of today. However, the ancient Egyptians themselves in several chronological tablets and papyri detail the existence of these earlier periods of their own history. They talk of long periods when Egypt was ruled by the Necheru, the gods or principles themselves, and then another long period when Egypt was ruled by the Shemsu Hor, the companions or followers of Horus. The ancient tablets give the names of the kings and the regnal years, and when this is computed out, it comes out to something like 36,000 years. This is, of course, anathema to our contemporary scholars who ascribe these writings to the fantasy and romance of the ancient primitive mind. This assumes that contemporary scholars know more about ancient Egyptian history than the ancient Egyptians themselves. The situation is perhaps similar to Schliemann's discovery of Troy. Everyone thought that Troy was simply a myth, a fantasy. Schliemann took Homer at his word and traced Troy back to Turkey, dug in the right place, and sure enough found Troy. It's somewhat similar to the situation with the dinosaurs. Everyone argued about the, the giant bones that were being uncovered all over Europe and America. One of the 19th century scholars put together the argument that these were indeed the bones of extinct animals. The idea took hold, the ground was prepared, and everyone suddenly agreed that the dinosaurs existed. Within a couple of generations, the museums of the world were filled with complete dinosaur skeletons. We think we've got the evidence, the bones of that ancient civilization. A lost tale, hidden in the stones. Blueprints of a lost art, from a lost world. Behind the veil lies another Egypt. Think of Old Kingdom Egypt and the first images that come to mind will likely be the Pyramids of Giza and the Great Sphinx. These, Egyptologists assure us, are products of the Fourth Dynasty, around 2500 BC. Prior to the Pyramid Age, Saqqara went up, the great necropolis 10 miles south of Giza. Built by King Zoser of the Third Dynasty, around 2700 BC, according to a plan devised by Imhotep, a legendary sage, at once chief of the architects, mathematicians, astronomers, doctors, a sort of proto-Leonardo. Today, Saqqara is an impressive ruin. Even after three quarters of a century of extensive restoration and repair, it's still difficult to imagine Saqqara in its original, massive, elegant, pristine glory. But a faithful architectural reconstruction comes as something of a revelation if you were told that this was a new campus for the University of Arizona or New Mexico, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, you'd regard it as a work of strictly contemporary genius. This went up around 2700 BC. In and of itself, it seems to contradict the notion that this is a civilization barely emerging from primitivism, a civilization obsessed with death, possessing no real science, mathematics, astronomy, slavishly worshiping a pantheon of animal-headed gods. Something doesn't fit. And before Saqqara, there are the mud brick tombs of the kings of the first and second dynasties, around 3000 BC. Ruinous today, but originally covered in brightly colored adobe. The paint is gone, but some of the adobe is still in place 5,000 years later. This gives us some idea of the preservative qualities of the Egyptian climate. And as we shall see, it has some relevance to our redating of the Great Sphinx of Giza and of ancient Egypt in general. For we are told that Egyptian civilization 
began at this time, around 3000 BC, and before that, arising as if by magic out of primitive Neolithic settlements, producing crude pottery, crude agricultural implements and the like, nothing that would suggest the glory of Saqqara to say nothing of the pyramids and sphinx, supposedly just a few centuries in the future. There is a contradiction and a problem here, sometimes acknowledged, rarely addressed by the academic fraternity. It might be equivalent to going from the first horseless carriage to the contemporary Porsche or Mercedes with effectively nothing in between. Perhaps even more astonishing is the fact, also acknowledged but seldom addressed, that Egypt was at its height early in the Old Kingdom. Nothing produced by Egypt thereafter surpassed and seldom equaled the masterpieces of the Old Kingdom. Moreover, it's generally accepted that in Egypt all of the sciences, mathematics, astronomy, medicine, the hieroglyphs, the religious system, were all in place by Old Kingdom times, with no indication or little indication of a period of development. 500 years to go from this to this? Here are the facts. Around 3000 BC, dynastic Egypt appears almost out of nowhere. Artistically and architecturally, it starts simply. No stone structures, but massive mud brick tombs and small but accomplished stone and ivory artifacts. Yet it would appear that the sciences are already intact and fully developed. Mathematics, astronomy, medicine, the complex enigmatic funerary texts, that knowledge is the legacy, and it takes but a few centuries to bring the execution of that knowledge, architecturally and artistically, to perfection. From a time stretching back into murky prehistory, the art and architecture of ancient Egypt stand as proof of an almost supernatural control of the material world, and an eerie understanding of the secrets of nature and the laws of beauty. Nowhere is this more apparent than at the Cairo Museum, where hundreds of thousands of priceless treasures paint a very different picture of our distant, supposedly primitive past. Present at the very beginning, the supremely refined craftsmanship, the impenetrable materials, the harmonic proportions, and the esoteric content embodied within each work speak to millennia of development and evolution. In these enigmatic treasures, we see the telltale signs of the legacy of high knowledge and ability from pre-antiquity which empowered the ancient sages, architects, sculptors and scribes to realize timeless masterpieces which were simultaneously instruments of powerful magic. The Cairo Museum is a treasure trove, a kind of a giant warehouse filled with masterpieces. Within it, we find bits and pieces of direct and indirect evidence supporting our hypothesis of the lost civilization. We find, for example, little stone bowls carved from some of the hardest stones known, porphyries and granites and green schists and diorites that are beautifully designed with narrow necks and hollowed in the center. Now, we could not, with our machine tools, produce these stone bowls, and yet they date from earliest Egypt, first dynasty, pre-dynastic Egypt even. The other finds from these periods show relatively simple pottery, fish hooks, combs, artifacts of that sort. So we are suggesting that it is just possible that these extraordinary bowls which, as I say, we couldn't do today, are artifacts from that still earlier, highly sophisticated civilization. Left to themselves, if they're not destroyed, they're virtually eternal. They won't weather, they won't erode. There's nothing really to break them up. And so we're suggesting that, quite possibly, these were heirlooms handed down over the generations, over the generations. What they were intended for, we don't know. All we know is that they're carved from stone, we could barely work today. We wouldn't know how to hollow them out. We don't know what they were used for, but there they are. Beautiful, elegant, mysterious. <laughs>
These are some of these remarkable stone vases. Some of the most spectacular are actually elsewhere in the Petrie Museum in London and with you're at the Louvre. Take a look, see what they have there. But you see what's involved here? I mean, this is perhaps the most remarkable. This one and this one. That's a porphyry, which is a impenetrable stone. You know? I mean, these things have hardnesses. Yeah, well, this one, this one is, this one's relatively easy in, in the sense of hollowing it out. I mean, it's beautifully done, but you can see how you might do that with some sort of a hand drill. This is something else again, because the, it's hollow on the inside and the thickness of the lip is pretty much the thickness of the wall. These things are perfectly formed. They're, nobody knows how, how to do it. We don't know how to do it today. And the point is that these are, this is the interesting bit, these come out of either earliest dynasty Egyptian finds or pre-dynastic finds. In those Neolithic settlements, that's what you found was very crude pottery and little fish hooks and combs and stuff like that. And then suddenly these things. So it was Paul Roberts, my, my friend Paul Roberts, who suggested, hey, maybe these are heirlooms from that earlier period because it doesn't figure that if the rest of the stuff that you're doing are crude little pots, suddenly there's this thing involving a technology and, I mean, perfectly geometric. If you did, I'm sure if you did a geometric study of these, you'd find Consistent. golden section ratios and all sorts of stuff like that. I mean, these, these are complex, these are complex shapes. I mean, it wouldn't be any, wouldn't be complex on a potter's wheel. And that's diorite. Well, these are all, that one's a green schist, that's a porphyry. These things are, you know, modern sculptors with machine tools would think twice before they attacked something like that. And if they attacked it, they'd be very hard put to get a finish on it like these. I mean, look at that porphyry bowl. It was mind blowing. So we're thinking that quite possibly these things are handed down because they're, you know, they're indestructible. As long as they don't break or you don't lose them, they're there forever. You leave them out in the, in the weather forever and nothing's going to happen to them even. So this could be an intriguing part of the puzzle. And if it's not a part of our puzzle, then it's absolutely sort of inexplicable in terms of what else they found in these little Neolithic settlements. This is important stuff. The stones used to produce these, these bowls and also some of the other statues of Egypt almost defy modern technology. There's a hardness index. The hardest mineral known is diamond, has an index of 10. Next is carborundum. Steel files have a hardness of six. These stones are harder than steel files. The Egyptians are supposed to have had only copper tools to work these stones into shape. This is difficult enough, almost unimaginable, as far as the sculpture is concerned. When we come to hollowing out stone bowls carved of these materials, it beggars the imagination, and yet there are the bowls, and there are the statues. Further evidence we think, although we can't really prove this, is the esoteric message enshrined within some of this magnificent sculpture. Seen one way, we have, for example, in the Khafra statue, Horus protecting the king. Seen another way, we see Horus as the principle of salvation or return to the source, assimilated into the consciousness of the king. So we have a portrait of the divinized or exalted or self-realized human being. Two different ways of looking at exactly the same statue. This is carved out of that special kind of diorite. I said that in a, in a faint, in a in indirect lighting, glows. I mean, this is a, a, an impenetrable rock that when sculptors see this and they look at the finish on it, and you look down even from here, you see where the light is on it. I mean, it's a perfect finish. There isn't a ripple in it. It's almost unbelievable. But one of the really interesting things about this one, as far as I'm concerned, is the is when you look at it, if you look at it head on, all you see is the king, right? It's only when you get around to the side. It's only when you get around to the side that you see the falcon behind his head. Now the falcon represents, of course, higher consciousness, the return to the source, salvation, blah blah. But the message to me is is, is a very deliberate one on the part of the sculptor. He didn't have to do it that way. He can show the falcon bigger. You see, even the way the falcon's wings are uh, smoothed down into the headdress so you can't see him. So, in other words, enlightenment is not obvious. In other words, from the front, it's just a king. 
very royal king, but from the side, and it's usually said Horus is protecting the king. The king doesn't need any goddamn protection. What really being symbolized is, is that he's integrated the Horus consciousness into his own. If we look at these magnificent specimens of old kingdom art and realize that these are not just works of genius sculpture, but that they enshrine a highly sophisticated metaphysical and scientific doctrine, we begin to realize that ancient Egypt is not as we have been taught and that this doctrine could not have been developed within a couple of hundred years and is almost certainly a legacy handed down over the generations from that still earlier civilization. A strange and very provocative relic from earliest pre-dynastic Egypt is the Nama Palate. Underlying its enigmatic symbolism is evidence of a highly developed science integrating stoneworking, astronomical, astrological, and even magical disciplines. By enacting the domination of his enemies, by carving it in stone, King Menes was magically assured of victory. This is called the Narmer palette. Narmer is another name for Mena, or Menes, who's unified Upper and Lower Egypt in dynastic times. Normally said to be a victory over the enemies and all this sort of stuff, and, and as I mentioned on a number of occasions, the unification of Egypt is supposed to be a purely political, um, a purely political measure. This is First Dynasty, I mean, supposedly, the beginning of the First Dynasty. I mean, you see the Hathor ears up ahead there. I mean, the Hathor face, again, already intact with the cow ears, and the human face with horns there, instead of normally with the Hathor head to have the headdress and then the sistrum on top. This may be an earlier form, but Hathor is around from the very, very earliest time. Now, these guys in the center, that sort of interesting. For those who think, I mean, these, these occur here, and are, to the best of my knowledge, nowhere else in Egypt, again, ever. And okay, they're mythological animals. There are some people who think, gee, this is a long, you know, the dinosaurs lasted longer than anyone thinks. And that if you're trying to draw a dinosaur by memory, well, who knows? I mean, I certainly would not let, like to get up in front of the American Society of Rationalists and try to defend that point of view, but it's peculiar. And there is one Egyptologist, actually, who is reading this as an astronomical text, in other words, as the ingress into the age of Taurus, which is about 4000 BC. I like that. But already here, First Dynasty, you see Horus and the Papyrus Swamp, so all of this stuff is there, you know, absolutely from the very, very beginning. Standing as curious evidence of an earlier common source for disparate cultures, the boomerangs used by the ancient Egyptians bear a striking and inexplicable resemblance to those used by the Aborigines of Australia. There are hieroglyphs in Australia. There's a big argument over whether or not they're real. Wow. I can't go into this now. Th those are actual Australian Aboriginal hieroglyphs. And these are the Egyptian throwing sticks, which are there. I mean, some of them whistle when they go, some of them are meant to come back. This suddenly gets interesting, because all of a sudden you think that maybe there is a connection in that. Either the Aussies, the Aborigines got it from the Egyptians, or the Egyptians got it from the um, Aborigines, but here they are. I mean, no mistake, those are, those are um, boomerangs. An important piece of the Sphinx puzzle lies in an obscure corner of the museum. The inventory Stella records a fact that unravels the traditional dating of the Sphinx. It records that the Sphinx appears to have already been a sacred and venerated monument at a date when its supposed builder, Kepharon, had yet to be born. This is the so-called inventory stela, which tells that Khufu, Cheops, built a temple to Isis alongside the Sphinx. I mean, the Sphinx is there in Khufu's time and it's not built by Khufu. Oh, well, he was the pharaoh before Khufu, who built uh, the Great Pyramid, so that in and of itself means that the Sphinx is there in Khufu's time. So when did it, when did it get built then? Wow. The way that the academics weasel their way out of this is that looking, studying the stone, studying the scratchy hieroglyphs, they find that the language is actually late. late. It's late, late period hieroglyphs. But the late period were, were consciously 
trying to, um, it was a kind of a, a, a retro dynasty. They were consciously re, um, reviving the styles and all sorts of, I mean, all, all kinds of Old Kingdom um, iconography and Old Kingdom uh, sculptural styles and artistic styles. They were deliberately uh, reconstituting. The language had, of course, changed. So to argue that this is a, a late kingdom, sort of a late kingdom invention, really begs the issue. It's like saying that a 20th century um, translation of the Bible isn't really the Bible because it's not the King James Version and it's not in Aramaic. It's a translation. So really, it's a very powerful piece of evidence. Could the Great Sphinx itself be a relic from prehistory? Perhaps the most visible example of an advanced civilization in Egyptian prehistory is that the Great Sphinx itself. Although the head was quite obviously recarved in dynastic times, the body and the man-made courtyard in which it sits show signs of heavy water weathering. R. A. Schwaller de Lubitz spent decades in Egypt resurrecting the seemingly lost science of the ancients. In a discussion of the development and prehistory of Egypt, he notes, a great civilization must have preceded the vast movements of water that passed over Egypt, which leads us to assume that the Sphinx already existed, sculpted in the rock of the West Cliff at Giza, that Sphinx whose leonine body, except for the head, shows indisputable signs of aquatic erosion. It all begins, actually, from a single line of Shwala de Lubitsch in, in one of his ancillary books called, uh, translated now, it is translated as, as Sacred Science, and the King of the Pharaonic Theocracy, in which he is looking into the Egyptian belief that, or under that belief, knowledge that ancient Egyptians, that ancient Egypt goes way back before dynastic Egypt. And it's strange when the opposition, sometimes Zahi is always accusing me of, you know, part of being part of an Israeli plot to steal Egypt's history. And actually, actually it's the opposite. I was trying to give them their history back to them. And in fact, it's, it's a strange thing that this whole theory should meet with such intense opposition from academic Egyptologists when the historical precedents are all there. I mean, I'm basically doing what Schliemann did when he looked for Troy. He simply took Homer at his word and said, yeah, he's not making up a story. There was a, there's a city there somewhere. And he followed the leads in the, in the Odyssey and found Troy. Well, really, we're doing the same thing. The Egyptian texts themselves talk about these long periods, thousands and thousands and thousands of years, when Egypt was ruled first by the Necheru, the gods themselves, and then, which I take to mean realized human beings, you know, godlike human beings, and then another long period when it's, Egypt is ruled by the Shemsuhor, which means the companions of the followers of Horus. And the dates given, the Egyptians don't give dates in X number of years, but they actually list the names of the kings who ruled during these long periods and the regnal years, and if you add all of that stuff up, you end up with something like 34, 36,000 years, which of course is unimaginable in, in the modern idea of how history begins and all the rest. Um, but simply by taking it literally, uh, you end up with a totally different picture of Egypt. So, and so Schwaller was writing this long chapter quoting extensively from these various writers, Pliny and Plutarch and Strabo and all sorts of people. And then at the very end of this chapter said, throwaway line, and then of course the Sphinx has been weathered by water and not by wind and sand. And that was the thing with me that just clicked. Water weathering here in the middle of the Sahara Desert where there hasn't been any water to speak of for at least 7,000 years. The Sahara itself, a relatively new desert forming somewhere around 10,000 BC. When I read that, 
Lion and Schwaller almost thrown away in an argument supporting the ancient Egyptian belief or conviction that their own civilization stretched back many thousands of years, I realized that perhaps here was the key because water weathering was a geological question. It should be up to the geologists, not the Egyptologists and the archaeologists, to decide what caused that weathering. But geology, the matter of water weathering, that I felt at least in principle you could prove. And so that started off this long odyssey. West enlisted the help of geologist Robert Schock to present a revised model of Egyptian history based on geological data, including the evidence that suggests that this man-made structure shows signs of exposure to weather conditions that haven't been present since the harsh end of the last ice age. I'm standing in a vertical fissure on the southern wall of the Sphinx enclosure. This vertical fissure was clearly formed by water running down the wall. It would pick out the weak spots in the rock open them up into these fissures. This is clear evidence to me as a geologist that this erosional feature we see was caused by rain beating down on the rocks. And of course, whenever the rainy periods were, it doesn't mean that's when the Sphinx was built. The Sphinx has to have been there to get weathered by the rain. But then now the big the, the dating argument comes in. And, and even those of us who agree that this has to be water weathering and therefore at the very least, it has to be older than dynastic Egypt. Then the question is how much? And Shock takes the most conservative position possible, really, allowed by the data, which is about five to 7,000 BC. And I take the most, I guess, the radical view, but seems to me, in a sense, the most plausible. And again, it's following the Egyptians themselves when they're talking about 34 or 36,000 years. I think that's what it is. There's a lot of reason to think that the ancients, very, very ancients, knew about the precession of the equinoxes and the shifts of ages, you know, that goes, we're now at the end of the age of Pisces and coming into the age of Aquarius. And there's plenty of good reason to think that this knowledge of precession goes back into deep, deep antiquity. So if the Sphinx is actually intended as a Leo marker, it only gives you a couple of choices because the last age of Leo is around 10,000, 10,500 BC. This is the date chosen by Boval and Hancock for dating the Sphinx because everything else aligns. And then if you add to that the probability that the, that the Sphinx is looking, at, is looking at its own image in the sky when it rises against the, uh, the sun at, at the equinox, you've again got this 10,500 date. The problem with that date, as far as I'm concerned, is that in paleoclimatology, you know, and this is, nobody disagrees with this, that the whole Earth is in chaos at that time, following the breakup of the Ice Age, which happens around 12,000 BC for reasons no one is quite sure. Schock's written a very good book called Voices of the Rocks, where he, it's a kind of a state-of-the-art statement on catastrophe theory. So everybody knows that this catastrophe took place. No one's sure why. That's when all the woolly mammoths died and the woolly rhinoceroses, you know, all the mass extinctions are called the quaternary extinctions. All this took place. So. In my way of thinking, building all of this incredible stuff requires a long settled and, and stable civilization. You don't just build things like this in the midst of, of, a, of a worldwide global chaotic situation where there are earthquakes all over the place and huge floods and everything's, you know, everything's unstuck. So, but nevertheless, the star alignments work for that 10,500 date, but because of these, because of these these various, these, these, let's say, these mitigating factors, I don't like that date. And, but the next, the only other choice is to push it back another full processional cycle, which is effectively 26,000 years. That gives you 26,000, that gives you 36,000 BC, which corresponds to the Egyptian text themselves. So even though it looks outrageous, particularly to an academic, to me, it's the more plausible of the of the possible scenarios, and it just remains to be seen, you know, if we're able to actually date this thing. The age of Leo marks the beginning point of the vast celestial cycles known as the precession of the equinoxes. The Sphinx, as the marker of Leo, demonstrates a knowledge of complex celestial mechanics and the observation of phenomena spanning tens of thousands of years. Evidence of Egypt's inheritance of a massive body of knowledge, both material and esoteric, 
is literally everywhere. The intricate and highly developed lessons contained in this majestic and enigmatic monument speak to a sublime understanding of both the physics and metaphysics of man and his role in the universe. Another important piece of evidence is this peculiar rough construction buried in the heart of the Red Pyramid of Dashur, built by the father of Khufu, Seneferu, around 2500 or 2600 BC. This is always called a plundered tomb chamber. However, the blocks that comprise it have already been weathered, and yet they're completely protected by the pyramid built over it. For that weathering to occur, they have to have been exposed to the elements for a very long period of time. So what we have here is a prior construction, megalithic in its appearance. It looks rather like the barrows of England and Scotland and Wales, like New Grange, rather than a typical interior chamber of a classical Egyptian pyramid. And yet, there is nothing to explain how it could get weathered. It could not get weathered if it were just a part of a single stage of pyramid construction. It just didn't make any sense. There should be other stuff laying around. It's a tomb chamber. Where's the remains of the sarcophagus and all of that kind of stuff? And I just couldn't I'd look at it and I'd scratch my head and puzzle over it. And then on one of the trips a couple of years ago, there was somebody with me who was the editor and publisher of the Atlantis Rising magazine. And I, he was ahead of me as we were coming up here. And I was coming through the passageway there and he was ahead of me. And he, I heard him say, gee, look at that. These are very old rocks. This must have been built first and the pyramid built around it. And I went, ah, oh, yes, of course. You look at these rocks, they, they can't get into this condition when, if, 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 they're, if they're built, if the whole pyramid is built from scratch. These are rocks that have been out in the weather a hell of a long time. And Chuck, of course, this is his field and he now has seen it for himself and concurs. They don't, it doesn't look as though they've been subjected to the kinds of heavy rains that the Sphinx has been subjected to in the enclosure walls of the Sphinx, but they've been out in the weather a hell of a long time before the pyramid was built around them. And you look at the, the, the style of construction, it doesn't look like the Sphinx in the Valley Temple, it doesn't look like the Osirion. What it does look like, and quite reminiscent of, are some of the larger and more impressive megalithic ruins of England and Scotland and Wales. It has a kind of a New Grange look rather than an Egyptian look. Well. We're not really sure what we're looking at, Chuck and myself, um, except that we're damn sure that this is here first. And since we're on higher ground here than the ground level of the plateau, maybe there's something underneath. Maybe it's just an earth formation, but maybe this is on top of something else. We don't know. But what we do know is that this is older than the pyramid, and it is major construction. Those big blocks are probably upwards of four tons or thereabouts. They're, they're big chunk, chunks of stone to be, to, be, um, you know, to be bandied about. And as you see, they're kind of roughly put into place, but they're not, they're not, not natural rocks. They're rocks that have been you know, quarried and very roughly shaped, somewhat similar to, uh, let's say, the Stonehenge stones and the stones that go into New Grange and those megalithic constructions. So while there are obviously much remains mysterious, we feel that this is a very important part of the puzzle and it's part of the evidence that we just presented at the Geological Society of America's convention. We don't know, but if we came back in here with ground penetrating radar and seismographs, we might be able, not we might, we would be able to determine what's under here, if anything, and um, this, could be, this could be a major surprise in store. Anyway, what we're damn certain of is that it's not a plundered tomb chamber and almost equally certain that it, we're not, ah, we're not quite, we're, we're, we certainly don't think that it's a tomb chamber at all for anyone, or if it is a tomb chamber, then it's a tomb chamber from a deep antiquity long before dynastic, long before dynastic Egypt arose. So what we have here with this curious megalithic looking chamber is an earlier construction. It could not be part of a single 
pyramid building enterprise. It was there first, it got weathered, and the Egyptians, for reasons of their own, then constructed the massive red pyramid on top of it and around it. What we're looking at here is the Valley Temple. It's called the Valley Temple of Khafra. It's adjacent and just to the south of the Great Sphinx. What we're looking at are huge granite blocks applied to a limestone core. Now, it's our conviction that this could not be done in one simple stage, in one stage of construction, because the granite blocks are fitted very carefully to the already pre-weathered limestone. And if this is the case, and it is indeed Khafra who applied the granite, it means that the core masonry, these are blocks that were actually quarried out from the Sphinx enclosure, that core masonry has been weathered in much more ancient times and had the granite applied at some later date, probably by the pharaoh Khafra. But as evidence, it means that the water-weathered limestone core was already there. Upon examination, it's clear that this could not have been done in one stage because the limestone core blocks have already been weathered when the granite has been applied. There's no other way for this temple to have been built in a single stage. Therefore, if the granite was applied by Khafra, or perhaps even earlier, we think, the limestone core has to have been built earlier and represents an earlier stage of this particular temple. Ancient Egyptians who are ancient to us, here in this case, they were preserving something in the sense of the original limestone temple that I believe was very ancient to them. And they were acknowledging that antiquity 4,500 years ago. This would have been originally roofed over, we believe, and then it would have been diffused light coming in. Which again, I can see the diffused light coming in and being reflected up by the polished white alabaster floor. But it would have been much more effective than you know, just a, a perfectly smooth sort of mirror-like floor because alabaster gives this sort of breakup and diffusion of the light. I mean, now I'm starting to visualize what it looked like. It, 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 it. If you built this temple of much smaller stones, it would be a totally a different effect. Different if you built it a brick, it, if you built it a brick, totally it would be totally different. Totally you couldn't different. measure it. Maybe you even could. I don't know. Well, you, yeah, yeah. But it'd be totally different. You'd, you'd just it'd be totally different. Okay, and let, let's put it another way. You can measure at least in an intuitive sense. You go, a lot of modern buildings, they are trying in a very crude, simplistic way to mimic this, I think. Mm -hmm. And what I'm referring to is where you have an interior that is um, steel bars and concrete and whatnot. And then, and this frustrates me as a geologist, they have a little thin veneer of real stone. Yeah. And so you have a thin veneer of real stone, sometimes in huge sheets of it, and they will cover it. They'll try to make columns. They'll try to make walls like this. But it never quite, it doesn't match. It doesn't, even when it's brand new, none of the veneers come off. You can tell. Oh, you know it. And you, it? And you yeah. can feel that. It may look pretty superficially. Um, and, you know, somehow, you know, it's like, how do you know it? Especially if it's brand new and, and all the joints match. But it's not the same. And you can tell that. I mean, they definitely were dealing with this stone, I think, for for ritual purposes, for specific purposes, um, uh, which would have included visual. I mean, giving visual effects, giving, um, um, I think, effects in terms of how it, um, when I use the term resonates, um, effects in terms of um, sound, sound bouncing and, and playing. And even, even without the roof, it has a resonance in here. You can imagine if it's roofed oh, over yeah, and you do absolutely. a chant or something like that in here, it'd be absolutely. like the king's chamber. 
Wait till you hear. Wait till you hear the, in the king's chamber. Wait till you hear in the king's chamber. I mean, the whole pyramid vibrates. Look at these peculiar corners. As you see, they're rounded, and in order to form them, they're not stacked up one on the other the way that we would build a corner but rather the whole face of the huge granite block has been planed away in order to get this inverse coin, these rounded corners. These are something of a mystery because there seems to be no, there seems to be no really good explanation for going to this much trouble to construct a corner. There are several explanations that have been offered. One is that stereo engineers tell me that in order to produce a true stereo speaker there cannot be right angles in it or it distorts the sound. It's a possibility that this was a consideration in the building of this temple. Another possibility is that there's a symbolism to it. In Egypt there is no word for temple. The temple is called Per Neter which means the house or the home of the god or principle. And the temple is meant to represent the living essence or to evoke the living essence of that particular god or principle. So it may be that in these rounded corners, the Egyptians are mimicking organic form. The whole edge of the stone, X number, if you see, I mean, they're, they're shaving off a few inches of stone to produce a corner that goes around the corner. But this, this, is, <coughs> this they do from the beginning of Egypt to the end. They're always doing this. And the reasoning for this, again, nobody really knows. I've had lots of builders and architects and structural guys on my trips and said, does this make it any more earthquake proof? And they all say, no, it's basically the same sort of thing. There's no Egyptian word for temple. It's called Pernater, which means the home of the god or the principle. And it's meant to be you know, a living structure, as it were. They're reproducing an organic form as best they can. In other words, a, a wrist joint or a knee is not an angle, it's an articulation. And it's sort of, in other words, if these things really are energetic structures and there's energy flowing around these things, paramagnetic or you know, whatever energies are intrinsic to stone, and there are energies that are intrinsic to stone, um, that this is, in other words, it's kind of forming a circulatory, a stone circulatory system. But wherever you want something that's going to be nice and salt, like the fusing of the skull, mm, right. um, what you do is you have something like the citrus and the skull. They're, mm, they're right. binding like that, mm. which I think is not dissimilar to what's happening yeah, in your corner what, there. Exactly. If, if, you, if you take it as, as a premise that these are in some way or another en energy enhancing right, structures, right, right, right. The, energy, the energy can go around and uh, an articulation as it does with our, you know, all of our right. nervous system and all right. the rest, but it right. can't go around a corner. Like right, this. it doesn't just go around a straight corner. Right. So, so in the uh, bones, you often have like right. a joint like this, That's it's articulating. Right. We see that in the socket there. Yeah. You have um, uh, different bones in the skull that all fuse together, but they're fusing like that with the sutures. Mm. They're not just a straight like that. And I think this ties right into yeah, what so we're in, seeing. In so far as is possible, it's mimicking. An it's organic mimic structure. Or organic yeah. structure. It could be that if these are indeed energetic structures meant as living buildings, living architecture, these corners are reproducing the way that energy flows around an organic form through our bodies. The technology represented by this living structure seems almost alien in function and aesthetics. In its beautiful, massive simplicity, there is an almost unsettling statement about the complete mastery of its mysterious builders and some clues to their long distant origins. The massive granite post and lentil design bear a resemblance to distant and megalithic Stonehenge, while the massive containing walls employ irregular stone shapes more reminiscent of ancient Peruvian construction. How long have these stones been here? Were they a witness to the original carving of the Great Sphinx? in a vastly remote age.
What was the original purpose of this strange place? This living structure is totally atypical of Egyptian design. There is a complete lack of hieroglyphics, and the stones used are of a size rarely attempted anywhere else in dynastic Egypt. But it is not alone in Egypt. The massive power and simplicity is seen in only one other structure in Egypt, the Osarian, which may itself be another dramatic artifact of prehistoric Egypt. The Osarian seems to already have been an ancient ruin when it was unearthed by Seti I during the construction of the Temple of Abydos, whose strange L-shaped construction may have been a result of building around the unearthed Osarian. This titanic enigma from remote antiquity incorporates tunnels that extend deep under the current water table, causing it to periodically flood. Since it is very difficult, if not impossible, to carve stone tunnels under water, it is hard to imagine how the temple was built in the dynastic era. It seems to me that you have to have something seriously wrong with your head to imagine that this is built by the same guy who built that temple. I mean, it's just inconceivable. And my, my own reckoning is that in all likelihood, when Seti was building his temple, he sort of stumbled on this, which was already covered with sand, and then skewed his own temple around, because it's very unusual temple architecture, that one with the two hypostyle halls here, and then suddenly the whole thing goes off, you know, goes off to the left like this. This is not a way that they would normally build a temple. And I think it's because he came across the Osirion, and then realized all covered up with sand, and then said he put in the sandstone casing blocks, and probably the the blocks that are behind the sandstone. You see over here, they sort of put in these packing blocks behind here. My conviction was that this is originally on floodplain. In other words, like, like Stonehenge, this is initially not cut into the ground. It's on, it's on at ground level. And one of my questions when Shock first got on, signed on board was, is that rock back there? It looks like kind of very rough, crummy rock. Or is it impacted Nile silt? And Shock took one look at it and said, oh yes, this is impacted Nile silt. The floor of this temple is a good 50 feet below the floor of the temple of Seti I. Geologically, there might be another explanation for this. I think it's possible that this temple is extremely old. It was built on the ground level. Then, over thousands of years from Nile flooding, sands and silts were brought in, which filled up the temple and eventually covered it completely. And so it's known, there are geological studies that in very, very ancient times, different studies, and we have to look into these, actually, we've not just had the time to do so, 12,000, 14,000 years ago or thereabouts, there was Nile floods much, much higher than today. You see, today's floods would only have gone up to the, the very bottom of the, where we left the bus. That's where the flood, flood plain came up to. Well, here we're way above that level here. And that's all impacted Nile silt. So at some point or another in the distant past, there were, there were Nile floods that took the sand level, that took the, the silt level up to here. So now it's a question, when we were here last, Chuck and myself, we took some unofficial samples there because you can date Nile silt because it's got organic material in it. So ballpark, when you get back that kind of age, it's, it, it tends to be not too accurate. But in theory, we should be able to date that silt. That doesn't tell us exactly when this was built, but it does tell us when the silt is laid down. And if this is there before that, well, then we're on to something very difficult for the, you know, for the academics to simply dismiss that kind of that kind of evidence when you add it in with all of the other kinds of evidence. As the father of history Herodotus wrote in the 6th century BC concerning Egypt, I will now speak at length because nowhere are there such marvelous things and in the whole world beside are there to be seen so many works of unspeakable greatness. <laughs>